Hello and welcome to Film Lovers. My name's Sonia Chung. We'll be talking to people who work in the film industry and who are also avid film lovers. Today I'll be talking to actor and writer Chris Berides. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I don't say it right. Spirides. Spirides. There you go. Yeah. Spirides. Really a professional. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> friends can manage. So, um, why don't you start off by telling us where you, where your surname comes from? Oh, okay, uh, my dad is Greek Cypriot. Uh, oh, I did kind of wonder if it was a Greek thing. It sounds yeah. like it, yeah. Yeah, so he came over here and met my mum, Crikey, uh, 60 years ago now. Yeah, wow. 61, 1961 he came over. And... Uh, and my mum's British, um, like seriously British, like there's uh, English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. And a bit of Romany hidden away as well. So, um, yeah, yeah. Typically British, I would say. A mix okay. of everything. But you were born here? Yeah, I was born in, uh, born in Walthamstone. Well, Leightonstone, Whips Cross Hospital. Okay. Um, and I should mention, so this is kind of like a link. Um, you are friends with, well, you go tell everyone, who are you friends with that we've previously spoken to? Interviews. Um, I, I know Mark uh, Brown, Mark A.C. Brown, uh, David Whitney, and Brad Watson. Um, I've known Mark and David for, oh, must be about 12, 12 years or so now. Okay. Is it longer? Jeez. I could, no, it's like 14, 15 years I've, oh. I've known them. Crikey. Seven. How did you I, meet them? I met David Whitney, first of all, at um, Edinburgh Festival. Okay. Uh, mutual friends. Um, I was doing a play up there and he was gigging as a stand-up and, um, and we had a mutual friend. And... Uh, um, yeah, just ended up hanging about uh, with each other quite a bit. And because of that, because of the mutual friend, I ended up doing a, an actor's showcase for actors that were without representation. And the piece, so all of the pieces in that showcase were new write, bits of new writing. And the piece I was given was written by Mark. So... Um, so that's how I met Mark. Oh, okay. And then he introduced you to Brad, did he? Oh, Brad. Yeah, Brad, um, I met more recently, maybe five years ago. Okay. See, I had this 10-year figure. I know. Look, I'm 15. It's just like that. The 80s <laughs> only feel like 20 years ago to me still. Well, that's so. it, is that it's quite deceptive, is that sometimes something that happens a long time ago can still feel like yesterday. And I think with COVID as well, especially last year, like everyone automatically refers to last year as 2019. Like last year was just like... Yeah, right. Right. It's like two years, just total pause. Isn't yeah. It? It's, what, did you, what did you do in your COVID days, granddad? Oh, uh, God. Um, nothing. I, I, I can't remember. We went into lockdown in March last year and... That lasted, how long did that last? It was about four, five months? I, 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 don't, I don't even no. know anything. Um, I mean, don't know what I was doing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I do remember doing lots of, because I swim a lot, but I do remember because everywhere was closed and the pools were closed. Um, I live really close to Richmond Park, so I just used to go around Richmond Park and do long walks around there. Nice. Um because it helps to keep moving and, you know, it's good for your brain. Because if yeah. I'm stuck inside all the time, it, it drives me crazy, literally. So I just kind of need to keep moving and it's quite therapeutic, actually, in a way. What about you? What's yeah, you Absolutely. Do? I've seen, I've actually seen people that have uh, suffered greatly from, from isolation during this period. And, um, yeah, and it can, it can really turn people crazy as well if they end up going down the wrong YouTube echo chamber. <laughs> but you know Crikey. what's funny? Crikey, there's some madness out there, I tell you. I know, but you know what's funny? Um, Because I was telling you I suffer from anxiety and um, also depression, but I've had that 
you know, lots of counselling and CBT to help that. Um, there was a thing on TV and there was a woman, uh, an actress, can't remember her name. Anyway, um, and she was saying that because she has it as well. But she was saying that the people with like depression and anxiety were actually managing a lot better <laughs> than the people who don't and we're having to help them <laughs> do you know what I mean which kind of makes sense because in a way we have to fall back on a coping mechanism so Absolutely. if you're already managing yeah uh, health issues and you know it's like oh yeah I can I've spent a, a week editing something or whatever not leaving the house you know I've and been fine with it and um yeah, I mean, that, as well, that's something I've, I've got better with uh, uh, as I've got older anyway. When I was, you know, uh, in my 20s, maybe, mm. was, like, staying in was like, Jesus, no. Right? <laughs> Do what? Um, so you ne never get used to your own company. And some people are terrible with their own company. And uh, but I think it's one of the most important things. You've got to live with yourself, right? See, I think I'm the same as you. I could say like when I was in my twenties, I hated my own company. And then the older I got, I've become more comfortable with who I am. That's and actually necessary. I don't mind it as much. Yeah. And I, I actually then I can, you know, I don't have to be around people to to feel good about myself I, I don't know if that makes sense because there's other things like yeah, yeah I mean we're obviously both creative like uh, Mark David and Brad are so so that's kind of like you know that that in a way is fulfilling in itself and a good I guess coping mechanism in as well and you're releasing your your you know your creativity you're doing something whereas a lot of people just kind of don't really embark on anything they're too afraid I mean, um, that, that, that's what the arts do isn't it it's like you can take all of that all of that energy all of that negative energy and you can transform it and in the process of transforming it into a work you are also detaching it from yourself mm. becoming more subjective about about a certain situation um, and therefore, instead of you know, carrying this weight, it's now it's now become a thing. And yeah. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, that's healthy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so, one question I have I'll ask before we get going, ish is is do you have any juicy gossip on the other three? <laughs> and bear in mind, if you want to get in trouble, and also Brad's filming at the moment, so we have to be super. <laughs> What is he um, filming, by the way? Do you know? Sorry? Do you know what he's filming at the no, moment? No, I do. No, I do. I don't know. No, he posted I, I something on Facebook, and, and I put <laughs> I put a comment, and I said, are you tearing your hair out? Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't replied. <laughs> he's obviously too busy, so. so yeah, yeah. yeah, he'll be in the thick of it. No, I did think about making up rumours about David and Mark, so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just as valuable. So, um, <laughs> so here is one. Uh, David collects freeze-dried turds, which he then fashions into the shape of film stars that he admires. Are you serious? Uh, of course I'm not serious. But, you know, <laughs> we, we, we can make this rumour. We can, we can, you know, let this rumour spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, I, the thing is, I don't think anybody would doubt it. But... Um, <laughs> Um, all right then. So why don't you tell us basically because you're an actor and a writer. So I guess in a way you're kind of <laughs> you need uh to basically talk in two different persons really. So how did you start with the acting and also at the same time, how did you start with the writing? Where did it all begin? Acting, been, well, I've always been performing, really. Uh you know, since the first ever nativity play I was in. I mean, it's really, actually, it's quite funny. A uh, friend of mine texted me the other day and he goes, uh, mate, my, my daughter has just been cast in the nativity as a door. As a what? As a door. As she's a door? She's playing the part of a door. She's not the only door, but she's playing the part of a bloody door. That's so and mean. To, and I did reply to him, you know, if you know, I, I <laughs> the first nativity I did, I played the king who brought myrrh 
I was dressed in purple and gold with a purple and gold crown. It looked fantastic, right? Now, if the only decoration I'd been wearing had been a fucking handle, <laughs> I might have taken a slightly different direction. So, um, but you, Clay, that was a good part for you. I never got, I always bad, wanted to be not married. A bad start, to be eh? married. I'm the murdered, yeah. You're the uh, murdered. <laughs> No, dude. So, I wanted to be Mary every year. I hoped they'll cast me as Mary, yeah. and they put me in the background somewhere. Like you know, I was like, be- uh, one one time I was a bell or something. Um, and I was just like, I was on the stage and off the stage as soon as you could say like this. And it was always like you know, the most um, uh, popular girl in the class or whatever that somehow got the bit the best part and I was seething in the background going I need to be Mary politics the biting I know castings so so carry on you were saying so that was your first I've been I've always uh, performed always wrote like little plays that we do in front of mates like at I remember doing a sketch show when I was eight with a mate where it was it was all kind of parodies of things you were into on TV. So the A-Team, Fame, Doctor Who, you know, a Knight Rider, you know, all these little skits about all of those kind of things. And um, and so that was pretty much my trajectory until I got the... Um, Funnily enough, until I got to sixth form college, when I started studying it properly, so I was doing an A-level in theatre studies, and it was at that point that I got into a band. And then that was the next seven years of my life taken up doing that. I was a singer and lyricist in in a band for all of that time. So acting took a massive back burner and... uh, you know, I'd even forgot that it was an ambition but, uh, uh, because I was so involved in the music right up until the moment when I I kind of remembered what I <laughs> what my previous path had been and uh, applied to drama school. Um, yeah. what what kind of music did your band play? Uh, kind of indie, indie, broadly, broadly indie. Okay, so like. Roughly what time period was this? In the 90s? Uh, 92 until 99. Okay. I guess. So it's a so big was, indie thing then, yeah. Uh, from, yeah, I mean, yeah, totally in the middle of the Britpop period. So uh, kind of surrounding that. So from 17 until 20, 24, 23, 24, the last band I was in split up around about that time. Okay. Um, and then... um. And then I applied to drama school, and uh, yeah, and then it's been it's been this trajectory more or less. What last, drama school did you go to? Arts Ed in Chiswick, Turnham Green. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, was that like a full time course that you did? Absolutely. You know, one minute late and you were suspended for the day. Really? You, yeah, three times late, you're suspended for a week. Yeah, really. Um. Brilliant! It's the best. Jesus, you so you soon learn to be punctual. Yeah. Um, Did they? Uh, so, like, was it one of those where it was during the daytime, or you were allowed? You had to work during the daytime to afford it to go in the evenings. No, no, it was totally. Uh, it in was the weekend. To, it was nine nine till six every day, nine till five. So it's like a full working day, you know. Yeah. I mean, we were always told by the teachers at the time, you know, Jesus, embrace this time because you're not going to be working this much when you get out there in the real world. And it's yeah. true. The luxury of six weeks rehearsal on a play, stuff like that as yeah. well. Um, yeah, you don't, of course, you don't get in the real world either. Um, yeah. So. Um, the one I went to, um, well, I only did a one-year part-time course, and then we did um, Lambda exams in that one oh, part-time okay. course. But there was also a full-time course, and that was two years. And um, the way the um, <clears throat> the headmaster or whatever it was and his wife organised it was basically 
that they could work during the daytime to fund their education. So they had to go straight there after, you know, their full-time job um, yeah. for evenings and weekends. And that was for two two or three years, I think. Two no, years. We were very lucky. We came through, because we started in 1999, um, we came through at a time when funding was opened to a lot of working class students who couldn't have afforded to go to drama school before. Um, also in my school, there were a lot of EU students that were able to get grants. So we had a, a huge balance of nationalities, Icelandic, Swedes, Danes, Norwegians, uh, Croatian guys, somebody from Australia, um, somebody who's Spanish, somebody who's German. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, but yeah, we always referred to our grants as the Blair check. Because, oh, really? Uh, yeah, because prior to that, prior to that, there was no funding, and you'd seen that, um, you'd seen that through television in the eighties and nineties. Theatre, you know, a lot of the, a lot, a lot of that world was dominated by people like you know Juliet Stevenson or Kenneth Branagh. You know, people of a certain certain class, and so it was quite difficult for working class actors to break through. And um, yeah, God bless the Blair Check. <laughs> Um, how many were, I mean, how many of there were you in each class, roughly? Um, in my year, it was 35 of us, um, which then shrunk to maybe 31. I think four didn't end up completing. Um, and of course, that then gets split into two halves for different classes, usually. Mm. Uh, yeah, and... Yeah, and sometimes into smaller, smaller classes for more kind of niche things like other stage combat or stand-up comedy and things like that that were okay. on the yeah. Okay. So um how did your writing career start off? Um lyrics, really. I mean, I was okay. a story writer as a kid, but the first time when I I felt like it was something serious. Um mm. I was writing lyrics and poetry and uh, and getting into what that form demands. You know, the idea of, um, well, the thing is about, broadly about pop culture. I mean, what you're trying to do is you're trying to distill larger ideas into an easily understandable format that the person on the street can understand. Mm. That, that's That's kind of... What pop culture does and I learned to not be afraid of pop in itself the idea, pop ideas um there's a brilliant uh book of Orson Welles interviews where he's interviewed by Peter Bogdanovich and uh Welles makes you know he's asked about pop culture and he makes the he makes the totally uh, brilliant um assertion you know what, what he says is you know the thing is we People frown upon pop culture, but what what's Dickens? You know? What what Shakespeare? The, mm -hmm. Shakespeare and Dickens are pop culture. You know, Shakespeare was taking all of these wonderful things he'd read, uh, you know, the, in Latin and Greek, all of these ideas, and then reframing them for a for a, a, a British, for an English, and specifically a London audience, and then as we know. A lot of the times in the plays, then as well, he'll say the same thing kind of three times. Once aimed to the the expensive seats, mm -hmm. and then something for those that have had a grammar kind of school level education, and then in a way that's understandable for the the man the man on the street that is totally illiterate. And um, yeah, um, and that. I think, you know, that's part of what makes him great and I think makes him a touchstone for anybody with their, you know, uh, in any uh, form of art. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, who were your uh, acting influences growing up and who were your fa favourite writers growing up? I cry to you. Um, I guess it's, well, it's film, so anyone film-wise, I guess. So who were your favourite film actors and who were your favourite um screenwriters i guess that's what well, I think, uh, for, 
when you were growing up? I always preferred kind of comedy actors um, or actors that had a kind of comic touch to them. So if you're looking at like the golden age of cinema, it was people like Cary Grant and James Stewart, who always, even if they're in a kind of serious part, there's a kind of irreverence to them. There's a kind of like, life isn't that serious, we'll be all right. Mm. You know, Cary Grant, if you look at his performance, for instance, in North by Northwest, you know, which is, you know, it's such a, it's a serious thriller. His life's on the line. And yet he's still able to play it with this light touch where he's, you know, you get, yeah, he's, he never loses his humour. And I think it's right. almost a lesson for life in general. Yeah. About, <laughs> just about the way he performed Cary Grant was massive for me and then of course you know earlier on there were the more obvious comedies he did Philadelphia Story Arsenic and Old Lace uh, Bringing Up Baby things like that but later on I guess um, Gene Wilder was a massive massive influence uh, okay. for me. Um, I think what Gene Wilder does um, is is he bring or what he did was bring an intensity to to his characters, to the way he delivered his lines, um, which is just unparalleled. It's just he, <laughs> he he can he can be so intense and and um yeah, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's just he's quite, beautiful. He's quite scary in that film, was it? Um... Uh, is it Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory? Chocolate Factory, yeah, yeah. I don't think I ever saw that film, but I've seen bits of it, and actually it, it, he is quite creepy in that film. But it also looks like, I don't know, because it was in the 70s, it looks like they must have been taking lots of LSD or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> it was quite creepy, I think, in that film. But he's amazing as well. It's a trippy book, the original, you know, that, that, that it's based on. And uh, the character is, yeah, deliberately weird, mysterious, isolated. So that's just, uh, yeah, that's not necessarily showing what he does uh, yes. at its best. Yeah. Um, for me, it's the, the work he did specifically with Mel Brooks. Um, the producers? Uh, the producers, um, <laughs> I and uh, Blazing and Saddles, and and y- Young Frankenstein, which he uh, he wrote well, and then um, with some tidy up from Mel Brooks there. Um, so yeah, I got great admiration for him, uh, and also that he 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 tried to write as well. You know, Young Frankenstein was his. Uh, the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes's smarter brother as well that he did with. With Marty Feldman, it's, a, it's one of my favourite kind of guilty pleasures. That film, it's flawed, it's it's messy, but um, mm. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And anyway, do you have any favourite writers as well when you were growing up? Uh, I think like f- f- film. Yeah, I guess. Um, I guess one of my favourite writers was Paul Schrader. Um, okay. who, Wrote the script for Taxi Driver, for instance, um, and ended up di- writing and directing his own film, um, Blue Collar, not long after, which is just one of my favourite films. Totally adore that. That's with um, Richard Pryor, Harvey Cartel, and Yafit Koto, and a very young Ed Beakley Jr. as well. And it's just about union politics. Yeah, brilliant writer. Still, still working now. Still, uh, he's just uh, written, directed um, a film called The Card Counter, I think it is. Okay. Which no, is just out this month. Okay. Me. So when the pandemic, because we briefly spoke about this at the beginning, first broke out, were you working on anything at the time and then did it have to be put on a halt like everything else? Um, no, I, was, I was teaching at the time. That was the thing. So I um, I teach um, improvisation. Okay. Uh, um, most often to people that have mental health issues, uh, anxiety, mm. uh, anxiety, um, all forms of depression, more serious stuff like bipolar or schizophrenia. And um, so, of course, the thing is, because you're dealing with people with anxiety, the class rate, 
the amount of people that were attending the class, don't they, like the canaries in the bloody coal mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> the class attendance was dropping off before, just before lockdown, because already they were like, oh, I can't risk this COVID thing. I'm not coming into class. Oh, really? <laughs> So, like, our, our last class before classes were totally stopped was only attended by a third of the of, of those that should have been there because they all had anxiety. <laughs> I mean, it's not were, funny, but it is as well. No, right, of- right, exactly. They're like, screw this, I'm not coming in. <laughs> right. um, so it was when we got the phone call to say, hey, don't come in indefinitely. And, um, yeah, it was kind of expected. Did you manage to keep going online, though? Because there were lots of classes still going on. We by started day. up, but it took a bit of time to for the machine to, to get COVID. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That. And that's where we're at at the moment. We're about to do our first live drop-in later this month. Okay. Um, that's our first in, geez, since March. 2020. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So was there, were you doing anything else during, like, say, when the second lockdown? When was the second lockdown? I forget. I think that was in November. Yeah, November, wasn't it? And then we were all stuck indoors for Christmas. Oh, um, that was awful, wasn't it? It was horrible. I mean, I got... <laughs> yeah, that was the worst one. It wasn't and a nice Christmas, was it? Already Jane did. Um, it was kind of an adventure, the first one, for a lot of people. I found it like that. It was like I, I had the chance to do all those little tasks you just shoved to the side. Like, yeah, well, that was a good thing, I think, about the, about the lockdowns. You know, yeah. it gives you a chance yeah. to do all the things that you never had time to do. And like you said, chores and things that, you know, like, oh, I can finally do that now. I can do this yeah, and I can do that. You know, you know, yeah, that, that's a drawer full of all those papers that you're planning to go through because you know you only need to keep some of them and then the yeah. rest can be recycling and all of that kind of stuff taken care of. But, uh, yeah, that I, I loved that. I loved that civilization had momentarily been put on hold so that I could go through my, my cupboards and sort out what I didn't want. <laughs> civilization. Do you know so, what I did like about it? It was was going out and the streets being so quiet was and there's no cars on the roads and everything. And then as soon as like it started easing off. And it was coming up into the summer. We had a really nice summer that year, didn't we? It was quite, it was a really good summer. Um, there were just people everywhere and I couldn't handle it. And also because of the anxiety as well, I can't handle people everywhere as well. So I was like, ah, go back home, <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> so that was kind of a good way, but it was eerie as well. It kind of, um, oh, yeah, well, it was a bit eerie. It kind of reminded me of that film. Did you ever see that film? Um, is it 28 Days Later? The Absolutely. zombie. I've seen that film. Love that film. Um, yeah, yeah, that whole opening sequence where London's totally deserted. Yeah, because he wakes up, doesn't he? And it's like the opening. Yeah, uh, they shot that at like half four on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, to get that, and if you look closely, you can see like little figures on the in the distance. On oh, really? The... Yeah, yeah. But, zombie uh, figures. <laughs> Just normal people going about their business. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. Because you would think in a really busy tourist spot, how the hell do they manage to... Yeah, yeah, and that's what makes it brilliantly eerie. How yeah. old were you in that film when you saw that film? I was 21. 2001? Is that when it came out? I think it was 2002. No, it's 2002. All right, so now I would have been 26. Definitely. Yeah, that was the year I graduated. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah my yeah. friend made me go watch it because I went up to meet my friend from college and he was like, okay, let's go to the cinema. And he paid for me, which was really, he was such a sweet guy. And um, he and I was like, I don't want to watch it. I don't like horror films. And um, there was one bit where these zombies come out, out of nowhere. And I dug my nails <laughs> into his arm. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he went, Jesus, I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> trying to hide my eyes the whole time I'm such a wimp like that but yeah um did you go with anyone as well when you watched it 
it, I can't remember who I went with. Yeah, because obviously at the time I'm a massive fan of Danny Boyle because, of course, he'd done Shallow Grave and uh, Train Spotting, which were generationally, you know, I was 21 where, when Train Spotting came out, and that was a massive mm. film, kind of generational film. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about that in a bit if you want, about his film. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, um, 28 Days Later, I believe it's the f- one of the first films in that period, certainly one of the first British films that was shot totally digitally. And it's very primitive digital camera. So you can notice, you know, the, that's the bit where they get to the barricaded tower block and then the bottom of the stairs is all blocked up mm. with shopping trolleys. Now you can kind of see the pixelation just because there's so many straight lines from the shopping trolleys, you yeah. can see that it's not quite 35 mil quality yeah. at the moment. But, it I, um, sorry. but in general, it gives the film a totally, at that time, totally kind of contemporary feel, a totally mm. feel, it feels immediate, it feels almost like documentary-like. Um, yeah, I love that film. My... Um friends who run a small production company, I mean, I haven't spoken to them in years, we just lost touch and they moved on. Um, he hated that film. I think <laughs> for that reason, he didn't like the way it was filmed with the with the digital cameras or something, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But yeah, it's funny how um, everyone reacts differently, obviously. That's what, yeah, I, that's uh, the, what one person will like the other person won't. It was the dawning of, you know, it was the dawning of a brave new age of which we're in now, you know, and we're mm-hmm. in the page and none of that would have been possible without you know putting digital technology in the hands of you know anybody can make a film um on their phone now yeah. um, that that's in the hands of of anybody and that's yeah. a beautiful radical thing because once upon a time you can only shoot film on film stuff and christ that was expensive really uh, and, um and, you know, a digital card, you can do as many takes as you want now, mm. quite basically. So um, if you've got willing enough cast uh, yeah. and crew, then, um, yeah. To do. Yeah. So, do you, so obviously Danny Boyle is one of your favourite English directors because you mentioned him. Yeah, so, I've got a lot of time. Well, particularly for that early work. Yeah, there. yeah. For that generation, the 90s. I mean, I yeah. remember because we're probably roughly about the same generation you're a few years older than me but when train spotting came out there were just posters everywhere weren't they and what it was an such... amazing, amazing uh campaign oh, yeah God. and nobody had seen a poster like that before had they and the music no, was I, amazing yeah the way they singled out the five main characters the way the it was you know the stark white and orange of the you know it looked it looked like a it's like a Campbell's tennis suit, right? In the red with the red. Yeah. And it's 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 given you yeah. It's a poster campaign inspired by you know all, all of those great printers like Warhol. Yeah. And also, I think it was during you know it has the advantage in that there's the soundtrack was amazing, and that was during like you said during the time of Britpop. So it was Britpop everywhere. So there was. Blur and who else was on the soundtrack? There was Iggy Pop. Primal Scream, Primal Scream is on there with the, yeah. with the tra- train spotting. Um, the one who sings um, uh, Such a Perfect Day, that one. Oh, um, Lou Reed. That's it, that's it. Oh, course, which is about you. taking drugs, that song. My mum, I tell you what's funny, is that that song, like, my mum, she didn't know that that song was about taking drugs, right? She, she thought, it's such a nice song, and she was really. She was kind of shocked when she realised that, um, yeah, it was about, you know... Well, some, of the, some of the prettiest songs are about heroin. Uh, Golden Brown by The Stranglers. Really? That's about heroin. Um, <laughs> there She Goes by The Lars. That's about heroin as well? There she, coursing Through My Veins. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> enough. There's, yeah. Oh, yes. That's definitely about heroin. Um <laughs> Um, I think I knew. Well, is there anything you want to say about Train Spotting? What What stood out for you about that film? Um, I well, it was just it's very brave visually. I mm. think um, there's so many iconic moments 
dreamlike moments uh, when he when he realizes that he has to go and fish the suppository out. Oh, the toilet! Oh, he dives into what oh, that horrible the, scene in the dirty the toilet. Oh, God. In Scotland, but then Brian Eno starts pumping through, and then he's in this you know this wonderful seascape and everything. Yeah, everything's uh, dreamy. Of course, the perfect day moment when he. Uh, he ODs and uh, just falls through the carpet. That's that for me is that's amazing. That yeah. moment and that, that the scene with the baby that's terrifying. The one that's falling on the ceiling. Yeah, <laughs> that's that, that's cold turkey for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Brilliant. What uh, did you think of uh, Robert Kyle's? What was his character called? Beb. 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 Absolute psychopath. He was taught by a uh, principal from my drama school, uh, Maggie oh, really? Kinnock. When she had worked in Scotland, she taught Robert Carlyle. A um, fantastic actor. Um, mm. Got a lot of time for him. He was, of course, kind of became famous here when he had a supporting role in a show called Cracker. Do you remember Cracker with Robbie Coltrane, who played a police psychologist. Yeah, yeah, I remember he had a small part in that, didn't he? It was like yeah, he played, yeah, he played uh, a Liverpool fan that was out for revenge against mm. the Hillsborough disaster. And uh, and that's the episode where Chris Eccleston's chief inspector gets killed off. Oh, which okay. was, that was an unheard of thing in a major drama to, like, take one of your main characters and just and kill yeah. him off. It, it was... Sure. I mean, it was brutally shocking at the time. So, uh, yeah, no, not time, not time for uh, for Robert Carlyle. Yeah, great he, um, Apparently, when he did, like, just after he finished shooting Trainspotting, he went straight on to do um, the Full Monty, didn't he? To, oh, to did he? Yeah, it was quite back to back. And no, 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 no. Sorry, what am I talking about? Start again. <laughs> so basically, um, Trainspot had been released, and then. Not so long after, it was the Full Monty, and they were both really big films. So he was yeah. like from one big film straight on to another one, and it was like two big, um, I guess, kind of circuses going on at the same time. Um, so it was kind of like a double whammy for him. Was that one of your favorite films with him in it, the Full Monty? I thought about that oh, film. Really. No, <laughs> Is it not one of your favorites? It's an all right way to waste an hour and a half. But yeah, it's I, a fun yeah. film. I don't think I love that film. I don't think it'd make a top hundred somehow. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> what are your other favourite um Danny Boyle films? Unless you want to talk a bit more about Trains Boy in this one series. Oh, uh, I love most of Sunshine. Um I have the issue that um Tarantino has the same issue that I have. I think Sunshine's a wonderful film, a wonderful examination of um of science, of the argument of science versus fundamentalism. It's such a post-9-11 film philosophically. But then the last reel turns into a slash movie, and it kind of, up until that point for me, it was kind of up there with Solaris or, mm. or 2001 or, or, or not, obviously not quite that high, but in terms of being what one would think of as serious sci-fi, philosophical science fiction, and then it just kind of loses its brain in the last <laughs> 20 minutes. And, it's, <laughs> and you've got a feeling, it kind of feels like a test audience pressure or something, or I don't know. No. But it kind of ruins, kind of... Yeah. And that for me is what well, it's an all it's, it's an all time shame because up until that moment, I mean, God, that film's amazing. Up until that moment, yeah. What did you think about Danny Boyle um, directing the two uh, two thousand twelve Olympics ceremony? Was it the opening ceremony? Wasn't it? Yeah. Was the opening ceremony? I I was. Did you watch it? Yeah, I did. I wasn't in the country. It's kind of weird. I've been I bought up in East London, and then the one time the world decides to turn up in your backyard, <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, oh, I'm not sure I really want to be here. Um, but just by chance, I I um, 
it was it coincided with um, me moving to Italy for a year. Oh, okay. So I, I lived in Venice for a year, and I was working in a touristy show about the story of Venice out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I yeah I saw it. I didn't obviously didn't feel the same connection to it not being it was a bit hit. strange wasn't it i found it a bit odd yeah it was amazing I, to watch it just i just I, it was just a bit yeah. strange <laughs> i found it yeah um, parachuting queen and all of that <laughs> james bond and <laughs> rowan atkinson page on top of a bus i mean i don't i i don't know what any of this said about being British at the time. I mean, they talk about it as a golden age of cohesion, but here we are, not very much later, as if <laughs> disorderly. Like, <laughs> Britain is now the drunk that's turned up at, <laughs> at half past two in the morning. Nobody knows what's wrong with them. They're just shouting a lot. And um, yeah. Have you they, seen that funny? Um... My friend posted it to me that there's that funny video and it's really cleverly edited. It's James Bond, the, the new James Bond film. And um, is it, I can't say his name. Is it Ralph Fiennes? Fiennes? Fiennes. 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 Ralph Fiennes. Fiennes. And, and he's saying, um, I need to call the Prime Minister. And it's a really serious moment. And then it cuts to Boris, <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson get, looking for his papers going, um, um, Oh, blast like this and he needs to start he's like like you know the baffling idiot that he is going on and then he's like and then he starts talking about peppa pig world or something and james yeah, bond is like, I, I have seen that um <laughs> I've seen the peppa pig stuff um <laughs> they say you get the meters you deserve we must be terrible people <laughs> is i it, mean is it if that's what we deserve jesus <laughs> i mean just dig a massive hole and we can all jump in it. <laughs> Isn't Kenneth Branagh going to play him? Sorry? Someone's going to play him, aren't they? Is it Kenneth Branagh? Um, or was that a rumour? I, 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 I could see that. I could see that working. <laughs> um, yeah, Br Br Branagh's popular. It's, um, yeah, we get what we deserve. Look at it. We Look do. at it. You know, it's just because the majority of people couldn't care about politics and they, they just, to them, it's another branch of entertainment, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and look at him. I mean, that's what he is. He's uh, also on spitting image as well. Like, you know, the, those, <laughs> I mean, he's every uh, comedian's dream, really, really, isn't he? Yeah. But also, he's kind of like Trump. There's an element of it that's already beyond parody. He's already. He's already a parody of, of a human being, mm. right? And uh, so it's like, how do you how do you how do you lampoon that which is already laughable? It's um, he does the job perfectly fine by himself. Just actually playing videos of him unedited, and you know, like that Peppa Pig nonsense. <laughs> He's um, to all of the top business minds of the country, right there. <laughs> oh, <I'm not> <laughs> um, have you got any favourite films where people are portraying a real person since we're talking about that so for instance uh, what was his name Martin Sheen played the Prime Minister in The Queen with Helen Mirren um, do you, uh, so, that's a good one to start Michael Sheen as Brian Clough he's an amazing actor isn't he and The Damned United as well, okay. which is uh, mainly focuses on Brian Clough's 53 day reign at Leeds United. Um, yeah, brilliant performance here. I, I don't know how he does it. He just kind uh, you know, his, his David Frost and Frost Nixon, likewise, he, he's, um, for me, he's like the best out there, uh, being able to, because there's a danger when you're entering the realm of mimicry that you're not going to be real, that, it, that you're going to deliver an artificial performance. Yeah. And that's something I never feel when I'm watching Michael Sheen. And, he, and yet he's able to be a, a perfect mimic in he's some ways. He's played quite a lot of, of, of already, you know, 
uh, people in our in the, yeah. in the entertainment. Yeah, so, right. so now we've got we've got Tony Blair, we've got David Frost, we've got Brian Clough. Also, he's in the film Fantabulosa, which is the life of Kenneth Williams. Okay. Again, astonishing performance. Really? In which he, he lost like two and a half stone to play the part. Because wow. Kenneth was so kind of stick like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and what was the other one? The one that came out with um, the famous scandal in 2002 with uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Oh, oh Tarrant. Yeah, yeah, he played the uh, the the, the, the main... famous, <laughs> the famous. Oh no, he's talent. He's talent, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. A, he's a brilliant talent. Yeah. Is it, is it a film or a series? I don't know. It was a TV movie. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah, uh, it must be really hard for him because, like you said, he's not an impressionist, and no. I don't know. It must be really strange. Play, you're not a. Uh, yeah, we're always told at drama school it's not what you put on, it's what you take off, right? It's the bits of you that you take off to leave those things that are parallel to the character you're playing. And yet, but how does that explain portraying Chris Tarrant? I know. <laughs> you, have to, you have to, you know, he gets the way he uses his mouth perfectly you know little details like that yeah little, the little kind of shadow movements how way he uses his hands the detail in the work is astonishing mm. um and yet like i said it uh, he, he obviously just works so hard in embedding all of those things that he can then relax and let the performance breathe on top of it all um, yeah astonishing. You know, um, those fa so those people that do that for a living, the impressionists, for instance, um, they're 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 obviously actors as well originally, right? And imagine, yeah, but, you know, but you know what's funny is that you think um, if they were doing you in front of you, <laughs> right? You'd notice so many things that you don't realize you're doing. Do you know? And that would yeah. make me really. It's quite interesting because you'd be thinking, "Do I really do that? Do I do, does my mouth really do that, or do I really move like that?" And it and like I said, they're so clever at like focusing and zooming into these little mannerisms that yeah. you do. And um, I think when you watch it on a, you know, if it was the actual person you're watching, you wouldn't pick up on that until the impressionist comes along and does their version. You're like thinking. Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting take on it because then it really gets you thinking about yeah. people's mannerisms. and. Absolutely. Uh, we used to do a cabaret at drama school that uh, um, me and my drama school mate, David, David Norton, we, we'd compare it as a, as a failed stunt act called The Cunning Stunts. And... Uh, our headline act, the first time we did it, was Alistair McGowan. And Alistair McGowan, literally, the first thing he did after being introduced was did a quick impression of us. So that is fucking awesome. What was that like when he did you? <laughs> well, he did the characters we were playing. So, oh, okay. So, yeah, he did us, but he didn't do us. You know what I mean? It's, uh, mm. And it was only brief, so there's not enough detail to then go for, for those moments. Yeah. Was, it's a do I do that? <laughs> no, but, yeah, if there's a whole film about your life, Christ, that's that's got to be something to... <laughs> what are your other favourite films of people, uh, of actors portraying real people? Um, do you have any other ones? Well, so it doesn't have to be necessarily politicians. It can be... Anyone. Oh, funny enough, um, yeah, JFK, the, mm -hmm. um, where Kevin Costner plays Jim Garrison, the New Orleans district uh, attorney, because he's nothing like Jim Garrison in that film at all, Jim Garrison. Mm. But he manages to, to conjure some essence of him, some, some, some emotional quality that he, he nails. Um, um, but he he's doing something completely different. He's not going for a 
He's not doing it the way Michael Sheen would because mm. Costa obviously was a is a very different kind of actor. Mm. Um, but he manages to just pick out key things that are true to Garrison's nature, which um, just make it a, a, an awesome performance for me. Yeah. And doesn't Gary Oldman play... Um, who does Gary Oldman play? He plays... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's hardly in the film. Most of the stuff he did as well went, ended up in... Uh, well, it's in the director's extended cut. It ended up on the... Um, cutting room floor but I love the story with that piece and literally Oliver Stone once he'd cast him just gave him a bunch of money and just went mate go and find out who this guy is right literally go do your own research travel to all these all these places where he lives uh, to New Orleans to Dallas um Go speak to his wife if you can. All of that kind of stuff, and um, and it's an astonishing when you see all of the extras as well. When you see the work he did on that film, yeah, it's an astonishing, astonishing uh, performance for somebody who history has possibly misrepresented, mm. not wanting to fall yeah. down too hard on any side of, of that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but there have been cases where there have been, you know, after the films come out where the actual person really didn't like the portrayal of yeah, themselves. Sure. Sure. But, then, but then it's like a fictionalised version of them, isn't it? It's it's them, but it's, it's uh, I guess, a heightened version of them. As soon as they see something, they, like, people, I don't watch it, but people think, think the crown's the truth, don't they? Oh, yeah, they do. Oh, yeah, it's... <laughs> Oh, it's just nonsense, isn't it? <laughs> but there are some amazing actors in there, like Olivia Coleman. I mean, she's brilliant. Yeah. Um, Had no, another one Carter. And uh, they've had Matt Smith, and who, who's the other guy? They've had, um, oh, crikey. Oh, John, uh, John, uh, John uh, the American actor. Oh, John Lithgow playing... Uh, yeah, Churchill. Churchill, which is like, crikey, that. No one saw that casting coming. No. Uh, yeah, that's pretty astonishing. Um, and who was the one who played the first, the, the young Elizabeth, and then she left after what's her oh name? She was a Matt Smith. I, I, I don't watch it. You know what I mean, don't you? Yeah, I don't watch it, but I just I know <laughs> that they're in. Um. Don't know. Claire <laughs> Foy. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Is yeah. That yeah. The one? There we go. They no, got their picture. <laughs> Trying to think of the the actor that plays one of the early um, is it the early uh, Philip? No, season three and four. Tobias Menzies, who um, obviously he, he played Brutus in the TV series Rome, HBO's Rome, which was uh, he's a brilliant actor. He's somebody mm. that doesn't get enough work mm. right there. Somebody hire Tobias Menzies a bit more, please. Um, if you're listening to this, definitely. Um, um, what did you think of Gary Oldman's portrayal of Winston Churchill? What was the name of that film? I can't remember it. I've not seen it, to be honest. Uh, no. the, oh, is it The Dark Hour? The Darkest Hour? You know, oh, you haven't Darkest seen it. Hour, that sounds about right. Not seen it at all. No, okay. It was no, um, good in it, but I never saw <laughs> no, I don't see that. No, I'm just, uh, yeah. Um, he's a brilliant actor, though, isn't he? I mean, no, he's, he's an amazing actor. Um, Do you the, know what tour he went to? No, I don't actually. I know he's from, he's from South London, isn't he? He's from Brixton. Um, oh, is so he? He directed, of course, the With now and now. My Mouth uh, film, one of those films With that only watch once. It's really hard to watch. Sorry, I said with Nell and I. It's not with Nell and I. That's the other one with what's his face, Richard E. Grant. What was it called? With Nell, uh, with Nell, Nell by mouth. Nell by mouth. I don't know. why I keep saying with Nell <laughs> and I. Um, yeah, by that's mouth. a hard. That's a hard film to watch. I, I mean, it's an amazing film to watch, and it's obviously very true to his his um, upbringing because he was brought up by and the dedication at the end, like this, yeah. like. So it's, it's not an easy oh, film to watch. <laughs> no, and 
but so, then that's the uh, that's the, that's the, the thing behind it you know it's it's it it's not a movie movie do you know what i mean it's it, it's a film that he wanted to make because at the time there weren't films like that it's the only thing he intended up directing right so obviously mm. it's like i'll tell this story and then that that's all i um all I can bet. Yeah, it's an astonishing piece of work. It's hard to watch. It's obviously got, it's got, I mean, some amazing performances. Not, you know, Ray Winston, the Kathy Burke, Charlie oh, Cook, Miles, is astonishing. There's an actor I think that's worth their door. There's somebody that needs to work more. Charlie Creek Miles is, um, yeah, astonishing. Yeah. Um. It's a shame. I mean, I do kind of hope that Gary Oldman would start, you know, doing a bit more directing. But because, I mean, he's got the capacity to obviously he's shown it. Um, but I guess, like you said, that was the only story he really wanted to tell. Yeah, so, well, that's, that's the thing. And uh, I, th I think he still feels he's got a lot to give uh, as an actor. Uh, I mean, cracking. I mean, that's... So so many awesome performances. Mm. Back from you know when he's in Sid and Nancy, um, directed by the by the great Alex Cox. Um, that's um, astonishing performance right there. Um, Prick up your ears, of course, where he's Joe Wharton opposite uh, Alfred Molina as as Halliwell, uh, the lover. Um, yeah, what 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 a, what an actor. Yeah, but no, I've not seen, I've, I've got to be honest, I've not seen uh, whatever, Darkest Hour, there we go. Yeah, I didn't see it, but I know he won an Oscar for it, So, um, and it had a lot of, you know, good reviews and everything. Did like he win an Oscar, or did his prosthetics win the Oscar? Yeah, I, want, I can't remember. I think it was a bit of both, really. I mean, those prosthetics, how long does that take to put on? It's something ridiculous, like, Imagine that. That's that's. Can you imagine doing that every morning, waking up really early, going in, and then having to sit there while they put all this stuff on you for about God knows how many hours of, of, of madness? Yeah. Um, you'd have to try and find a way to just pass out whilst sitting still. I think. Yeah, and he was smoking um a lot of the cigars as well, and he got like nicotine poisoning. Did he? Yeah, he got nicotine poisoning. Um, and uh -huh. they, can you imagine that? And so they stopped for Christmas and he had to go for an operation. Um, oh. Yeah, so everyone else was going off doing their Christmas trees and their shopping and he had to go uh -huh. <laughs> into, um, you know, into surgery. So so that's dedication for you as well. <laughs> but, but, yeah, yeah. to go that you. far. So, um, but... Um, I mean, do you have any other favourite films where actors portray um, real-life people? Can you think of any? Um, I don't know. Is he a real-life person? Jesus. I'd have to say uh, Scorsese's <laughs> Last Temptation of Christ with Willem Dafoe. I mean, oh. I've, I've read the novel by Nikos Kazantzakis, who's a, a, a Greek, a Cretan. And, um, uh, rather than a cretin, and um, he uh, the, the novel is an astonishing piece of work, and it's one of those things where it's like there's no way you could ever adapt that. No, somehow Scorsese managed to do it. Well, the script is by again my man Paul Schrader, mm. who, um, who wrote Taxi Driver, and it's uh, Willem Dafoe is amazing in that film well he is an amazing character actor as well yeah right? yeah and it's maybe it's maybe my favorite film of his so telling of the of the jesus story if you will and um you don't think it i mean on paper it shouldn't work because it's full of we're, we're used to these subjects being treated with kind of some kind of unnecessary reverence mm arts to be played by people that have just fallen out of Rada. But then suddenly Scorsese has got like Harvey Keitel playing Judas and he's got Harry Dean Stanton playing 
uh, Saul that becomes Paul. Suddenly, it's it's more it's immediate. It's it's there. It's in your face. These people are suddenly just real people. They're not. Yeah. They're not something taken out of a kind of a, a picture book. Did um, you ever see the one with uh, that Mel Gibson directed? That one. Had yeah. Like, um, Who hard yeah, time, didn't it? Terrific I know. to watch. And I do wonder if there's an element, I mean, I do wonder about Mel Gibson, because there's an element of that film that could be classed as torture porn, really. You reckon, yeah. Like, because that's what, that's what a lot of people are about, weren't they? The fuck be out of him for half an hour. It's, um, I mean, he does the same in um, Braveheart, but in obviously in Braveheart, he's cast himself as the pseudo-messiah. Mm. Be, Taking a part on a table. So, um, well, that's also another, I guess, real life person he portrayed. Yeah. I mean, he directed the, the one. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, he, that's a great part. Or a great, it's a great film. Um, even though, you know, there's the accents are all over the place. It, it's a stirring piece of uh, Hollywood cinema. Um, I've got a good one for you. Um, since we're talking about accents, what did you think of Kevin Costner's portrayal of uh, Robin Hood? Oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> wow. That was, uh, he could do no wrong at that point. You know, the accents. Um, he had this run of films round right about then when he was like suddenly massive. And, um, and it was like The Untouchables was brilliant. Field of Dreams, he's brilliant in that. Uh, JFK, astonishing performance, and then for some reason he he does that, gets acted out of the park by Alan Rickman, which must have been absolutely galling. That one, Mate, but Alan um, Rickman was amazing in that film, though. I mean, he was so yeah. like you know, obviously he's he's the uh, the quintessential <laughs> typical bad guy, and then obviously he was in Die Hard as well as the. The bad. Oh no, he wasn't English in in Die Hard, was he? No, he was German. 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 Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's um, right. But yeah, no, he was amazing. He and and I think to be honest, he stole. Of he, he saw the movie of Kevin Costner, really. <laughs> and I bet you there's a whole other 10, 15 minutes that ended up on the cutting room floor. Of, you know, just because otherwise the film would have been absolutely unbalanced. Um, <laughs> And then Sean yeah, Connery I comes on. I did love the film at the time. You have to yeah. take it. You have to take it for what it is. I mean, it's yeah. not. It's not the Errol Flynn version, which for me is still the best version. It's it's still beautiful to look at. But at the time, it was a totally worthy retelling of of the story. It's it's you know what what do you expect from Hollywood? Yeah. In, 1990, 91. I mean, you know, it's. You know what? I remember that was because it was uh, Brian Adams, wasn't it? Oh, oh that yeah. song was no, number 13, one. 13. 13 How torture. many weeks was it? Number one? Yeah. <laughs> 13 yeah. weeks. And then Four Weddings and a Funeral did the same bloody oh, trick. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. Love is all around. Yeah. And. Bodyguard did it with I Will Always Love You. That was like number one for like nine weeks as was well. Really? <laughs> and it was... Fuck you, Costner. It was like... <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> so it was like Brian Adams again, the first week, good. Right, the second week, yes. And it went on and on and on. And it's just all... <laughs> yeah, it's the one thing that gives me PTSD watching the film. Oh, really? You think. Yeah, turn on the film. You think you're fine, and then you hear the you hear the melody played by the orchestra in the background and start shaking. Uh, <laughs> did you ever see? Since we're talking about Robin Hood, did you ever see the the version that Mel Brooks did with what's his name, the English Robin actor? Hood, men in tights. <laughs> yeah, it's, I remember uh, seeing it for my birthday with my friend and my mum and his mum. He was oh so good friends. Ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and the farting seat. Was it the what? Is that or was that another film? That was another of his film. But there was uh, that... Amazing Animals is the 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 the, the classic 
being <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, Mel Brooks, I, he kind of lost it for me a bit towards the end, but definitely those early films through the 70s produces Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Silent Movie, High Anxiety, all of those I, I adore. And then... And then it gets a bit patchy in the 80s. Yeah. Like uh, History of the World Part 1 and Spaceballs, which is not so a lot of fun, but just not totally successful for me. Mm. It's, um, but I would, you know, it's something on one of those guilty pleasures, something you would watch. And, you know, you catch it, it's already 10 minutes in, and it's like, Crikey, let's leave the, leave it on. Yeah. You know what's yeah. funny is that um, I saw the producers, I think it was last Christmas, actually, with my mum and stepdad. And um, and the scene that always cracks me up is the reaction of the audience when it <laughs> springtime <laughs> for Hitler <laughs> at Germany. Yeah. And he cut to the audience and her mouths are like, drop open. It has like complete shock. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because that's such a New York story as well. Because you know, you know, you know, a lot of the a lot of the comedy, a lot of the comedy world at the time, uh, great Jewish uh, writers, people like Sid Caesar, Woody Allen, Mel Brooks, all of these guys. Um, and so the yeah, the horror, the horror of of the Holocaust. And Hitler is very real for these people. For for the for you know, Mel Brooks is one of that audience himself, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, well, that's it. Nobody else could do it. That that's that's yeah, that's why he gets away with it. Absolutely, yeah. Whereas if it was someone who wasn't of a Jewish background, yeah, yeah, then yeah. then it could be taken out of yeah, uh, then, context. Yeah. So it's context, it's, geez, context is everything. Yeah. 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 And that, yeah. that's what makes that film shine so beautifully still to this day. Um, um actually I was gonna ask you a question since we're talking about the producers. Um, because it came up when I was talking to my stepdad. Are there actually does the, do you reckon that actually goes on where people where like producers go put on shows where they don't you know they just want to make the money back and it doesn't have to be it can be a complete flop and that's what they want it to be does that actually oh, happen no, to you reckon? i know now there it's a funny thing i'm not so sure how it is in the theater world but in but the I film world do you reckon well, it happens? i don't know that happens in the film world that you can get certain funding and certain tax breaks for your funders where you can essentially earn a very good living pumping out very mediocre material that's never seen by anybody. And, um, yeah, <laughs> we we do, you know, we know a director like that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say names on here. But, um, <laughs> if, if Mark and David are listening now, they're uh, a brother. Oh, they'll know, will they? They all know who I'm talking about. We used to try and get all four of you on at the same time. But then I think that would be like, I don't know, like back in school days and I'll be like the teacher. <laughs> I was like, now behave yourself. <laughs> One you at a time, put your hands up. <laughs> stay away from that if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't really think of anything else to say. I mean, can you think of anything else you want to say film-wise? Because we went on a bit of a roll. So... Actors who portrayed real people, and we went on about Martin Sheen, and we talked about Robin Hood. I mean, Robin Hood's been one of those films been done so many times, hasn't it? And then there was Russell Crowe. Yeah, they've, they've gone too far the other way now, haven't they? The, the, the Russell Crowe one is about as close as you can get to being historic uh, and historically accurate version of the story, and it's ultimately it's as dull as dishwater. Mm. You know? But it'll always be redone, you know, with um, America has, you know, Batman and Superman and, and all of those things, right? But I guess what, so. We've got, we've got King Arthur and we've got Robin Hood. And I guess now uh, you'd say Sherlock Holmes and James Bond. They're all kind of British superheroes. Yeah. Um, 
So the Robin Hood story or the King Arthur story will continue to be reinterpreted a trillion times before the heat death mm -hmm. of the universe. Another one that's been done a lot, re, re, uh, redone or re, revamped through the generations is uh, Little Women. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Just one of those. Yeah, because... There was a yeah. recent one, wasn't there? Yeah, and then there was the one way back with Winona. Yeah, remember that one. That was... See, the funny thing is, you kind of relate to the one, your generation. So I saw that when I was a teen. I, mean, I can't remember when that was. I mean, it was obviously in the 90s. But um, I must have been, I guess, 14-ish. I don't know. So when I refer to uh little women that's always the one i go to that's why i don't want to watch yeah. the other ones but i think that's a generation thing whereas this Absolutely. One... and it's and it's right that it's that story almost it, it, it's right for demanding continual reinterpretation mm. as, a, as a flag bearer of how far we we have come as a as a society yeah that's why it always becomes this kind of touchstone. Every 20 years or 15, 20 years, it will get remade again. And as a kind of like, oh, where where are we now? Yeah. Uh, you know, actually a good example of that, because we're talking about, you know, remakes and the generation thing, is that very recently the Steven Spielberg West Side Story has come out. Or is it coming out very soon? It was, you know what, the original. For I'm me, not watching it because I love the original too uh, much. <laughs> greatest musical of all time. It is amazing, and I'm not watching it. I just, I'd be like, no. However, however, have you seen the reviews that have been coming out? The reviews are astonishing. Really? The reviews are like Spielberg's best film ever. Only Spielberg could have pulled this off. <laughs> it's uh, the reviews have been astonishing. Yeah, and it was the one thing I've, for me, it was when I properly fell in love with musicals was when I was directing, you know, I'm eight or nine, and my mum, it was on TV on a Saturday afternoon, maybe, and my mum just went, You want to watch this? Mm. Like, it, like, it's important that you watch this. Because that was an important film for my, my family, because, uh, because my dad being a uh, Greek separate and my mum being British, her her mum was kind of resistant to the relationship at the beginning, as a lot of British people might have been to into interracial marriages or relationships. And the way my mum and dad solved the problem is that they took my mum's mum and all watch West Side Story. Right. Yeah, but that's it. Like it's like, and 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 they never heard a peep out of the family after that because that. Really? It's also reinforced that part of uh, Bernardo is played by George Shakiris, who's a Greek actor. So, oh yeah, of course. So, um, West Side Story has become an important film in my family's mythology. You know, yeah. the, uh, it's it's the. The film that got my mother's side of the family to go, okay, oh yeah, maybe if you're against interracial marriages, it does end up horribly. So maybe we should learn to be a bit more tolerant. Yeah. Um, so I've huge, huge connection to that film. And I was like that, why is Spielberg even bothering? But I'm going to have to watch it now. I've, I've not seen reviews like this for, of, of anything for ages. Yeah. We're, the, uh, my family didn't even watch it. So we're going to go watch it together. Because, like, when we had the... Oh, I forgot to tell you. When we had the last lockdown, so I suggested that every week we do, like, um, no, like a book club, but we have a film club. So we take it in turns. So basically <laughs> there was a, a big cup with our names in it. And then at the end of each week, a name would get picked out and that person would have to come up with a film for everyone to watch. And then we, we discuss it the next weekend. Um, and actually it was really good because it's really interesting hearing other people's um, opinions. And sometimes one film that you love is another film that absolutely 
the other person can't stand and they didn't sort of get it to it so it is really interesting and also you know you kind of get into it, it is like book club because you kind of get into the kind of the nitty-gritty of it all and it's really interesting it's great to pick these things apart to deconstruct films uh it's great to find out how you your, your feelings for for something on I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of flawed things as well um, like it'd be very easy to do a list of what's your favourite films and it's 2001 and it's Godfather Part 2 and it's Citizen Kane and everything you know but sometimes watching something like like Jesus guilty pleasures like getting through Highlander like Highlander is for me it's on paper it's kind of terrible honestly but I turn Name me a time I've not switched over, found that it's on television, and then not watched it to the bloody end. Right? Really? <laughs> every <laughs> time, every time, just sucked in. It's uh, yeah. It's, uh, we should, we should em- and so we should embrace. Uh, you know, sometimes you want chewing gum. You don't need the art house all the time. You no. Know? So uh, those things, those things are important too. What are since you're talking about guilty pleasures? I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up so bet we can wrap up on this. So, what are your guilty pleasures? So, if you're having a really bad day or you feel really crappy and you kind of need cheering up, what are the films that you're going to go back and watch? Oh, uh, oh, it'd be any of the great cinema comedies, um, that would be Life of Brian or Young Frankenstein. Or um, Four Lions, for me, maybe they're my three favourite comedy films of all time. It's not just about comfort for me, it's just about thinking in a different way. You just need to not give yourself some cognitive dissonance sometimes. You need to, if you're not feeling great, it's, you know, it's, you can have a cup of hot chocolate, but it's you know what I mean. It's not about comfort. It's just about putting your brain somewhere else. That's the yeah. only thing. Yeah, That's, comfort is just putting it anywhere else. And um, so yeah, that, that'll be that'll be films I'll always go back to definitely. Okay, Chris, I think it's time to wrap it up there. Thank you for talking to me today. My pleasure, Sonia. Um, are you feeling better now? Because you were really nervous earlier. I uh, was slightly nervous, but that seems like a lifetime ago now. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. You've been awesome. It's been brilliant. You too. You've been absolutely lovely. And come back anytime you want. Thank you very much. I might just do that. Okay. I'll let you be. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening. And you. You look after yourself. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.